Hey, what's up guys, it's Tyler from Fable here. And today I'm gonna do a little reaction video on one of Coffee Break's Wall Street videos. It's a creator I really enjoy watching a lot of his video essays. And this one intrigued me the most because I have a few things that I'd like to say on that video. But before I get into that, please go down in the comments below and let me know if you like these reaction videos. If you do, I'm gonna keep on doing them again and again because I like doing them, I enjoy doing them, and I especially wanna keep doing them if you guys like them. And while you're at it, hit that subscribe button, hit that bell, and hit that like button, it really supports us. So without further ado, guys, let's get into the reaction. All right, so here's the video in question. Let me play it real quick, and uh, we'll get on the reaction. Wall Street is Las Vegas for smart people. It's where you take your money if you want to have the odds on your side. And like Las Vegas, it's full of people who think they have the winning system to get even further ahead. Hedge funds, value investors, your uncle who is sure that BitConnect is the next big thing, and especially Jim Cramer. They're all trying to outsmart everyone else. And this makes sense. Okay, so... I don't think they're really all trying to outsmart everyone else because that's not exactly how money is made on Wall Street. Like, sure, your performance does help. If you have great performance, that will help you make money. But it's actually more about raising assets, collecting assets, and managing a pool rather than performing well on that pool of money. And let me do a quick little demonstration for you guys to show you how that works. So go to the whiteboard here. Now let's compare two different scenarios. Let's say this guy has a million bucks and he is making... 50% a year, and then on that 50%, he is taking home a 20% performance. So let me get the calculator out real quick. All right, so we got 1 million times, we have 50% performance. So that guy made 500 grand, and then off of that, he makes 20% of that. So that's 100K. Now, 100K is gonna get you nowhere in New York. He'll probably barely afford the actual office rent. Even though 50% is a damn good year, right? That guy's a sick strategy. He's performing really well. Now let's look at what Wall Streeters are actually trying to do, and that's just gather a huge amount of assets and just perform all right. So let's do the other scenario now where this guy has, let's say, 1 billion, and he's just trying to make 6%. He's not even trying to make beat the market. He's just trying to make 6%, but he's going to, you know, promise everyone good customer service and he's going to promise everyone that you know they're, they're going to do pretty good and it's going to be safe etc and then off that six percent he's making uh well he's going to make the same 20 percent incentive bonus but he's also going to make one percent off of the asset base which is pretty common in wall street so let's pull up the calculator again and let's do one billion times one percent boom so right off the bat one percent of that one billion is already 10 million bucks. So he has a $10 million, he can afford his rent, he can afford employees, he can af afford, you know, extremely expensive marketing budget, he can, per you know, he can afford all these things, P you know, HR, everything that a business needs to run successfully, he can already but by, by not doing anything, he just gets the 10 million bucks right off the bat. Now, on a 6%, so let's take the same billion, and times that by 0 0.06. And that is 60 million, 60 million bucks. And then off of that, he gets 20% of that, which is right around $12 million. So he has this 12 million plus this 10 million from the 1% for a total of 22 million. Now, that's an actual revenue for a business that can support a business, right? Like 20, even $22 million in revenue isn't a super large scale business, right? Like the companies out in, in Silicon Valley that are making billions a year. This guy, he has a billion, billion dollars in assets, but he's only making, you know, 22 million in revenue off the year on that, which is still pretty good. You know, you have relatively few employees, but that's a livable wage and he's barely making any money in the market, 6%. Whereas the million dollar guy, this guy right here, he's crushing it with his awesome secret strategy of 50% a year, but you know, he can barely afford rent in NYC because he just doesn't have the asset base. So it's really, more about making a large asset base and having all that asset gathering that rather than it is doing well in the market and performing at a very high level when it comes to Wall Street. The legend and mystique around Wall Street is that if you're clever enough, you can be like Midas, ensuring everything you touch will become gold. But for many people, this is the sexy side of Wall Street. Bring me your poor masses and if you're smart, we'll make you rich. And many people believe that story and chase its promise. But there was an idea that challenged that narrative that radically suggested that it may be impossible to improve your odds beyond the average. Even brilliant money managers, hedge funds, and the best investors may be no better than monkeys at picking stocks. Number one rule of Wall Street, nobody 
Okay, if you're Warren Buffett or if you're Jimmy Buffett, nobody knows if the stock is going to go up, down, sideways, or in fucking circles. Least of all stockbrokers. But before we get to monkeys, let's first talk about the big question. The question some of the greatest minds in the world have spent their lives trying to answer. The one that would make you rich. What will the price of a stock be tomorrow? And the answers to this question are as numerous as you might expect for an alchemy recipe. There is fundamental analysis, technical analysis, buy and hold, value investing, growth investing. That could go on pretty much forever. And the point is, at this time, it was thought that if you had money, you needed to find a genius on Wall Street to invest that money for you. Someone who, through some secret strategy, managed your wealth in exchange for a fee. The idea was that their expertise would get you returns on your money that would more than pay for their secret formula. And this is how you made the big bucks if you're on Wall Street, managing people's money and charging a fee for it. Okay, so yes and no. Like I said before, if some of the strategy helps with the market and helps you raise assets, but really where the big money is made on Wall Street is asset gathering and promising people that you will be a shepherd of their money and helping them through the tough times. So we all know that there's a ton of volatility in stock markets. And even let's say that even this investor, he's not using a complicated strategy. He's just trying to help someone use buy and hold. Let me go back to the whiteboard. So we all know buy and hold is going to have a path like this where it's going to go up, it's going to go down, etc. And your average person, your average investor, they can't even hold on to this ride without someone advising them and coaching them through these ups and downs. The average investor, the second that they have a big drawdown, they quit the game right here. They're gone. They're saying, no, I cannot do this. The stock market's not for me. There's no way it can work for me. And they're exiting the game. But if you have a professional helping you guide you through all of that, when you have these little run-ups and then the drawdowns, the, the coach could be there saying, hey, don't worry, stick with it, it's gonna be fine. And then you actually remain in for when the market recovers and continues on. So a lot of the value that these high finance guys are providing the clients are just the psychological coaching. We talk all the time about psychological coaching on the channel because that's super critical to be successful long-term in trading. But a lot of people, you know, especially people that aren't interested in this and don't wanna do it full time, they're busy with other stuff, they need coaches to kind of help them when those hard moments come. And amidst these competing views of the stock market and wealthy wealth managers, along comes an American economist, Burton Malkiel, who looks at the market and essentially throws a monkey wrench at the traditional theories. In his book, A Random Walk Down Wall Street, he says, no, you're all wrong. The stock market can't be consistently predicted by any theory. The only predictable thing we have about the market is that the whole thing tends to increase over time. No one is able to consistently pick winners over anyone else. And boldest of all, he predicted, a blindfolded monkey throwing darts at a newspaper's financial pages could select a portfolio that would do just as well as one carefully selected by experts. If this is true, Malkiel goes on to say, instead of paying big bucks to Wall Street to let experts manage your wealth, the best thing to do is to find a minimum fee fund that buys up hundreds of stocks without discrimination for winners and losers and just holds them passively because the future of a stock is fundamentally unknowable anyways. Because if your average return is the same for both strategies, expert management and monkey management, why would anyone pay for the experts? Okay, so again, I think I already talked about this before, but people are paying the experts to help them coach through those hard times. But that's not to say there is a lot of BS out there in Wall Street, and a lot of that is getting taken out of the industry in the last 10 years. And you guys have probably seen all these articles come up with Vanguard, you know, sucking up all the assets and passive funds sucking up all the assets. That's because, you know, Wall Street itself was sort of a bubble. Like back in the 70s and 80s, people saw all these people making a ton of money. They all flocked to Wall Street. Then boom, all these products come out. There's a ton of offerings. There's a ton of supply with people that aren't that great at investing. And they were just offering, they were actually offering suboptimal strategies for high fees. And so that actually is getting all swept out of the market. But that's not to say that no one can ever beat the market. And that's actually, it's completely impossible. I think that's false. We've seen a lot of people that actually do beat the market consistently over the long term. And, you know, we, re we write about this all the time on the MacroOps blog with our Trading Great series. And those guys have consistently outperformed year after year. Now, it's hard and it's rare to do, but it can happen. So, you know, I'd say for the most part, yeah, this, you know, coffee breaks right that you, know, you, you can th a monkey can throw some uh, darts at a, at a board and pick just as good as, you know, a guy that's really diving deep into the fundamentals. But I will say that many of those guys that are diving deep into the fundamentals, they aren't really doing it correctly. 
because they're going into the S&P 500 and they're just buying, you know, a bunch of stocks that are very similar to the index, right? So like, for example, one of our value investors, Mr. Beam, he's digging down to way, way, way smaller companies, way far down the beaten path that aren't ever looked at by investors. And that's what a lot of the high quality value guys are doing today. They're not looking at the S&P 500 and trying to say, hmm, what are the best 10 companies out of this 500 and trying to beat it that way? They're going way the far out. They're going doubt, you know, they're diving deep down to the Russell small caps and they're finding the absolute best deals possible and they're betting big on those deals. And that's how they're able to make returns better than the S&P. It is next to impossible to go and just pick out your favorite 10 large cap stocks and actually beat the index over time. And many of these studies that look at the performance comparison between these large cap funds and the S&P 500, that's essentially what they're doing. And so it's, you know, that's a tough game. And yeah, you know, coffee breaks right. Like it's not really worth paying a guy to do that for you. It has to be a very specialized strategy. It needs to make a lot of sense. It needs to have very high returns. It needs to be worth the risk. And for the most part, that kind of stuff's not available to the investing public, right? That the very, very good stuff, it's mostly kept into uh, some very wealthy, sophisticated investors, or, you know, it doesn't scale that well. So, you know, the other thing with uh, a, a strategy that can perform very well is that sometimes, you know, it can't handle more than 100k or a million bucks or, or 10 million bucks and those guys you know they're just keeping it to themselves and they're trading it themselves because they can't really raise money around it the markets aren't liquid enough or the edge isn't deep enough to actually handle that you know a billion dollars or 10 billion dollars so that plays into it as well index fund of the early 70s exactly the kind of low fee fund that mount gale proposes you buy it pay a tiny maintenance fee and it just buys and holds hundreds of stocks now, if you're one of those expert investors, an index fund seems both silly and insulting. Random stocks, no technical analysis, no psychological analysis, no chart analysis. This was a challenge to the very ethos of Wall Street, a challenge to the idea of the Midas investor. And over the next decades, the battle between expert funds and monkey funds raged on. And after almost 50 years of data, the results are in and it's overwhelming. You can find hundreds of studies on this because this is one of the most surprising and overanalyzed things in finance, but here are the headlines. Over the last 15 years, index funds outperformed 90% of actively managed funds when you account for their fees. Yeah, so if you saw in that study there, guys, it was talking about large cap funds. I already talked about how, yeah, when you have a large cap fund that's trying to pick the best 10 or the best 30 out of the 500, that's very, very tough to do. Right. So I wouldn't expect any of those guys to beat the market, especially when you add their fee structure on top. So, you know, I think he has a point there, but it's not to say that no one ever could you know, beat the market. A lot of the guys that we write about on our blog, the trading greats, they did stuff that were drastically different than the market. Here's one of my favorite dudes that I've wrote about on the Macrops blog. And you guys can see uh, he was the pretty much the father of quant investing. And this guy's name is Ed Thorpe. Very impressive. I, I encourage you guys to read this article. I'll link to link to it down below. And he did an annualized return of 18.2%, which is absolutely crushing it. And he did a lot of interesting things with warrants and arbitrages and all sorts of other little trades that I wrote into here that you can see when the market actually gets inefficient, Ed Thorpe was very, very good at exploiting these inefficiencies. And so they do exist. These guys, you know, can actually beats the market but they're doing you know crazy things they're in SPACs they're doing uh you know short-term U.S. Treasury bills and they're you know they're they're putting it against gold and gold futures they're not sitting there and taking you know what are the best 10 stocks out of the S&P 500 and we see that same study repeated over and over again when it's really not looking at the whole picture of trading 90 percent of the smartest people on Wall Street made less money than monkeys and the 10%, well, given the averages, it starts looking a lot like luck rather than skill. After all, given enough investors, it's self-evident that someone will gain above average returns just by sheer luck. And we also have a study that even the funds that do beat the index fund one, three, five years struggle to continue that positive performance. And the number that do continue that positive performance year over year is about the number that we'd expect from blind chance. Just because you won 15 coin flips in a row doesn't mean you're any more likely to win the next one. Let's talk about why the future of the stock market can't be predicted. This is a long theorized idea called the efficient market hypothesis. And even for the people who don't subscribe to that idea, there's another confounding problem at work here. 
It's a game theory problem. It's a situation where there are so many rational actors in the system that the market can't be reasonably predicted. Because each time someone gets a winning method of valuing stocks, the next person will find a way to incorporate that strategy into a new strategy to beat the first strategy. In other words, everyone's strategy must take into account other dominant investing strategies into their formula for how the market will swing. But it's self-referential because the other rational actors will feasibly be trying to incorporate your strategy into their investing strategy. And this is kind of where it all breaks down. It's an ever-evolving game that you'll never win at long enough to beat the market average. So while occasionally there are exploits in the market, they rarely last for long and they're almost always found by different people. So I take a little bit of issue with that and I think he, uh, the way he explained it there was a little bit confusing. So he was talking about how one guy's strategy would impact another person's strategy, which would impact another person's strategy. And really I think here's a better way to look at that. So first off, efficient market hypothesis or EMH is absolutely false and that's been proven time and time again by legendary investors and the fact that it just doesn't really make that much sense, right? If it, if EMH was true, then there would be no point for anyone to look at the market and focus on it. And we wouldn't have anyone valuing, valuing companies at all. We wouldn't have anyone making trades in the stock market and making it efficient. So the, the paradox of this is in order for a market to be efficient, we need to have investors that are studying all day to actually bring prices in line. So without these investors studying all day to exploit the inefficiencies all day, you can never achieve a spot of efficiency, which is why the theory never makes sense. So here's how I like to think about it. So what happens is we'll have a market and it's inefficient. And so we have these speculators that come in and they say, hmm, this is, uh, this is, an, this is an inefficient market. So they devise a strategy to exploit this. And what happens is they keep on doing that strategy, they keep on doing that strategy, they keep on doing that strategy until the market reaches a efficient state because they have applied their trades and compress the spreads and the inefficiency down to a point to where the edge no longer exists. Then the edge no longer exists. We now have a different market and it continues on. And eventually because we have a different market, new inefficiencies are created, new edges are created. And then these same group of guys, these smart guys or other groups of guys, sometimes, you know, people that are able to exploit an edge in one era aren't able to do it in the next era. They come in and they say, hmm, let's develop a process to exploit these particular edges. So they do it, they do it, they do it, they do it. And then we enter into another efficient state and then the process repeats. So I think a better way to think about this concept, guys, is that edges do exist and an edge is essentially an inefficient state of the market. And people come in, they harvest these edges, they harvest these edges, and then after they harvest these edges, the edges disappear and we get back to efficiency. And then the process just repeats. We find new edges, we harvest them in new and interesting ways, and then the process repeats. So, you know, back then, a huge edge when markets before electronic times, you know, just getting the information before someone else was a huge edge. And so that's why a lot of the pit traders on the floor, let's see, can't really draw a good uh, example of, let's, let me draw a mini pit here. All those guys screaming at each other, you know, they're, they're shouting, they're shouting. They all have information and price updates quicker than, you know, this guy had sitting in his skyscraper up in New York. And so these guys on the floor actually had price information before that guy, that was an edge. Now, eventually that got disrupted. We had electronic markets come in. And so now this guy essentially gets the exact same information as these guys. And that's why we don't even have a trading floor anymore. But the market is a constantly ev you know, evolving mechanism. It's an evolving organism. And it enters states of inefficiency and efficiency. And this changes in flux over time. So the market's never always purely efficient and not always purely inefficient. And so what we want to do as traders is try to find the pockets and the moments in time that the inefficiency develops, go in there, strike as hard as we can for as long as we can until that inefficiency erodes and we no longer have the edge and then we exit and we look for the next one. That's essentially what trading, great trading comes down to. Even Warren Buffett, who is on the very short list of people you might argue has consistently beaten the stock market, when asked what to invest in, doesn't bother naming his own company or any other. Instead, he has a simple answer that would make Malkiel smile. He recommends you go get some index funds. So a big point of why Buffett says that is because his edge is actually sort of eroded. So back in his heyday when he first started, he would find these deep value companies that had insane price to earnings ratios that today, you know, would make people go insane and say, oh my God, how could that exist? But back then it was commonplace and he harvested all of those and made great returns. He also had a relatively low capital base and we're now we're circling back to capital constraints. 
as he grew his capital base, now he has billions and billions of dollars, he can't go in and buy tiny little companies. They don't move the needle for him. So he's forced to invest in these large companies. And then Buffett realizes, again, since of his, his capacity now, he's picking, you know, quote unquote, the best 30 companies out of the 500 on the S&P, and his returns are going to replicate the S&P very, very closely now. He no longer has that advantage of being a tiny little small guy that can go in and make super high returns on small little companies. And so that's why he's saying it. It wasn't like Warren Buffett got lucky or anything like that. Warren Buffett was legit good. He had a ton of skill. He crushed the market back when he first started, but now he's big enough to where anything he does is going to replicate an index anyway. You know, he doesn't. He has so much money. He can't dive into these little niche strategies and suck out returns that it would be better than the S&P. Impractical over long periods of time. There's no such thing as a consistently winning strategy over the long haul. It's much more like gambling, where the house odds are on your side. You're going to win some, and you're going to lose some, and you can't predict which. But if you stay around long enough, you'll win more than you lose. Really, the only thing you shouldn't do is pay someone to come up with fancy models and strategies for something that ultimately comes to chance. Just go and get some monkeys. All right, guys. So I think overall, he did a really good job on this video. I think it was informative. I gave my two cents on it. I think the last point I want to make before we wrap this up is that he says, you know, don't go pay someone a ton of money for an interesting strategy. And, you know, I think that depends. You got to evaluate it. You got to say, hey, you know, is this is this going to be much better than buy and hold? You know, if it's you're paying someone to pick the best 30 stocks out of the 500, that's a lot different than if you're doing more niche strategies or more hardcore strategies. So that's a huge component. But, you know, I cannot argue with the fact that just putting your money into low cost funds is an effective way to invest long term. If you don't want to really spend time on it, you don't want to put a lot of energy into this, the safest thing is to go into that low cost index fund and just accept the average return in the market. And it will build your wealth over time, but it's not going to necessarily get you extremely wealthy very quick. You know, if you want to do something that's a little more quicker and faster and grow your wealth a little bit faster than normal, you're going to have to dive down into the alternative strategies and look into stuff that can be more aggressive. All right, that's it guys for this video. Thanks for watching. Again, leave a comment below if you like this. If you like this reaction videos, I'll keep doing them. Hit that subscribe button, hit the bell, hit the like button, and I'll see you guys soon. Stay fallible.